right, hi chaps. Uh, as mentioned, my name's Alex Chapman, uh, and I work with uh, Context Information Security. Uh, I'm here to talk about the new release of our uh, Canapé tool and how it went about using that to identify a number of issues in the ESXi management protocol. So, oh, I've already covered this slide already. So, yeah, re we've released this new version of the tool for uh, in, in time for Oxcon, uh, so that's now live on our website. I'll give a link to it at the end that uh, everyone can go away and have a play with. I'm um, going to just have a bit of a talk about the ESXi management protocol, what it is, what it's used for, and how it's actually made up. And then I'm going to go through a load of demos about actually how to use this tool to intercept um, and analyze uh, ESXi traffic, do some men in the middling, um, do some traffic parsing, some traffic injection. Uh, towards the end, we'll do a bit of fuzzing, uh, talk about how you can go about uh, extending Canapé, and we'll uh, have a bit of a chat of uh, a number of the ODAs we, we actually identified in this for this uh, for this project. So first off, I guess what is Canopy? So those of you who don't know, uh, Canopy is a, a free tool released by Context. Um, it was first released uh, in March this year at Black Hat uh, Europe, uh, and it's a tool for intercepting and analysing and modifying uh, network application traffic. So it's similar to the uh, kind of HTTP proxies, your cats, your burps, your fiddlers but for the generic um, network protocol world. So this isn't just for HTTP, this is for any network protocol. Um, why do we need this, this new tool? Well, it's, we were doing, at the time we were doing a lot of work with arbitrary binary protocols um, and just found there weren't the frameworks there that we needed to um, be able to actually analyze, parse, and try and break into these. Um, so it was a, a homegrown tool for actually, for us to use internally and it got to the point where we actually thought this is this is pretty good. We should uh, we should keep going with this and release it for free to you guys. So uh, that's what we did. So yes, so the old way of doing it, this sort of thing. This is how we used to work. So we used to work in a lot of Python, a lot of Ruby, uh, using Wireshark for reference, and just, we just found we were reusing code, rewriting code every single time. So yeah, you would write a specific bit of Python code to intercept a specific, a specific protocol and modify it. And very little, of that, very little of that code was actually reusable for the next job that you, we came along to do. Um, and using Wireshark, fantastic tool for analyzing protocols. Um, but it falls over a bit when, when encryption's involved. Yes, OK, so you can um, decrypt SSL traffic when RSA keys are used. But um, other than that, it doesn't have a great, uh, great capabilities for actually being able to break into the encryption of a protocol. So you're kind of stuck on the outside a lot. And the way we've built up Canapé is to hopefully help you break into these protocols and actually get a, a bit more of a view of what's going on. So Canapé is, we like to consider it a GUI-driven IDE. So it is, an inter, uh, it is a development environment. You can do coding in Canapé where needed. But there's also a lot of built-in functionality that um, hopefully reduces the amount of code you have to, have to write. And then any code you do write is reusable for the next project and then the project after that. Uh, so the focus is actually on the data and the, um, rather, than, rather than the code. So you'll see as we go through, we can actually parse data via individual um, parsing nodes and actually manipulate data um, without having to write, let's say, a huge amount of code. Um, and it's, it's, we've got a large number of built-in modules that we can use within Canopy that I'll show you um, for, for doing this. So for parsing traffic, for modifying traffic, and for fuzzing it. Um, and then when coding is necessary, the Canopy IDE actually um, supports a large number of programming languages. So C, uh, C Sharp and Python, Ruby if that's really your thing, Visual Basic, even F Sharp if, you're, uh, if your framework supports it. So we want to try and make it as accessible as possible to every, uh, every tester out there. Everyone's got a favorite language. I don't want to tell you which language you should be writing in, although not Ruby, really. <laughs> So how, how does Canopy actually capture this traffic? How does it, how does it man in the middle of it? So it's, one of the things to note about Canopy is it's not an attack tool. It's very much an analysis tool. So you set it up as a SOX uh, proxy or as a port forwarding proxy, and you point your client at Canopy. So it's not something you would use in a penetration testing environment uh, on, on a client engagement to, uh, to man in the middle somebody's traffic. It's just not designed for that. It's meant for more the bug hunting and uh, the, the penetration testing against a specific service. Uh, so it supports 
TCP and UDP broadcast traffic. Uh, and it actually has a number of built-in application proxies as well. So I'll show you the SSL proxy. Um, it can be used as an HTTP proxy. But it's, I mean, for that sort of thing, there's very limited support. You're more better off with your dedicated tool. Right, so that's, I guess, Canopy. Um, what about the target we're going to use? So four or five weeks ago, kind of um, suggesting through this talk, and the, the question was, what, what are we going to target? So we wanted to pr pick a, uh, a protocol that would really let us show off some of the good features in, uh, in Canopy. And uh, the VMware ESXi management protocol actually uh, fitted that bill very well. And as we, as we go through, I guess we'll, uh, we'll be able to see why. Um, so this protocol is used for the management of uh, VMware virtualization uh, products. So I call it the ESXi protocol um, because that's what I've been using it on. But actually during this research, I, uh, we did identify that it's actually used for uh, workstation and a, a lot of the other VMware products as well. So when you install workstation on your, on your Windows 7 laptop, it will actually open up a number of management ports um, for you, which is very nice. Um, and so the, this protocol, or this set of pro protocols, so it's actually a number of protocols um, which encapsulate things like remote desktop, file transfer, and management of the um, virtual machines. There's a lot of HTTP going on, um, which I'm not particularly interested in. HTTP has been done to death. And there's, as I already mentioned, there's some very, very good tools um, to do that. But there's also another port uh, and protocol uh, which runs over TCP port 902. And that's where all the interesting protocols are. So that's where your uh, remote desktop protocol and your file transfer actually happens. Uh, uh, and it, to, uh, to exercise these protocols, you do need a bespoke client, which is the uh, VMware vSphere client. So I'm sure the majority of us in this room have used this before, um, whether just playing about on our own or, or if we actually manage these sorts of environments. So yes, so the protocols we're interested in. So, so I'm only going to really cover the protocols um, going over this TCP port 902. Um, we will see a bit of the HTTP, uh, well, HTTPS traffic, but uh, that's kind of more of a background thing. Um, so the, this 902 traffic is actually an, uh, multiple protocols over a single connection. So we'll see there's some uh, distinct protocol states that we have to handle. Uh, and covering things like authentication, um, remote desktop, network file copy, and this VMware database um, connections. I'm not going to touch on that last one too much. Mainly going to focus on the authentication, the remote desktop, and the network file copy. Um, and uh, interesting, uh, or good to note at this point, each time the, uh, this protocol transitions between one of these two states, so transitions to authentication or from authentication to remote desktop, a new SSL um, encrypted tunnel is negotiated on the same connection. So this is actually quite a problem for traditional, uh, traditional um, network proxies, where they'll do all or nothing SSL interception, rather than actually being able to upgrade and downgrade the connection as needed. And we'll go through and we'll see how we can do that during this talk. So uh, I'm going to give my, my first demo at this point. Uh, there will be a lot of demos. so. I'm going to have to move fairly quickly, so if we can try and keep up, and if there are any questions, I will, uh, I'll try and field them towards the end. So what we will hopefully see, I'm going to have to do a bit more scrolling around the re screen real estate isn't quite what I was hoping for for this talk. But so this is the um, kind of default can uh, canopy screens here. Um, it's very much an ID environment, so you've got your, uh, all your project files in the Projects Explorer on the left there. Uh, and what, what I'm going to do here is just set up two simple um, port forwarding proxies. We're going to run um, the vSphere client through Canopy, and we're going to see the, uh, the traffic being, being captured. So this is a, uh, what a simple port forwarding uh, proxy will look like from the configuration point of view. So all we do is we configure the, the port we want to um, pro uh, forward locally, the remote host, and the remote port we want to want to set it to. In this case, we are doing HTTPS traffic. So I'm going to enable this SSL all or nothing um, interception. And I'll ah. Right, what have I done? This is why you don't do live demos. I've got another version running.
Right. Let's try that again, shall we? that one off and then the same because we need uh, these two ports I'll set up a new uh, uh, port forwarding proxy for our nine, uh, 902 port as well so what these proxies will do is they will um, they'll push traffic down what, what we refer to as a net graph so if we show a simple very simple net graph for this port 902 to start with um, so this is how we actually go about manipulating the traffic and recording it so by default Canapé will not log any traffic um, we add in these, these logging nodes to, to actually do, do the logging. So traffic will come in uh, to Canapé via the server node, traverse the graph, the directed graph, and leave Canapé via the client node. Um, and then responses will come in via the client node, traver again, traverse the graph, and leave Canapé back to the client via the server node. Uh, and we'll see how we can build up these quite complex net graphs to perform uh, some, some really quite funky actions. Uh, and in this case, so I'm doing a little bit more processing on the, uh, the HTTPS net graph. Uh, I'm just going to use these two built-in nodes um, to actually parse the HTTP data, so just so we get it in a little bit of a uh, nicer format. And we will hopefully see, oops, got all data in there. That's uh, when I push the the client through Canapé, we'll start to see the, the application data appearing in these, in these logs. So if I start up the vSphere client and I log in with the credentials I've configured, uh, you'll notice I'm logging into the local host because um, I'm using that as the port forwarding proxy. So we will get, here we go, an SSL error when we do this. This is because we are actually intercepting the SSL traffic. So we're not trying to be... Um, covert when we're doing this. We are saying, yes, we are. Just like you would with a web application proxy, we are actually just intercepting this traffic. There we go, that's, that's gone through. And we're starting to see the application um, data co coming through into, into our Canapé project. And hopefully we should see, yep, perfect. Because I've put the um, parsing nodes in there for the HTTP side of things, we actually see we start to get some quite nice parse data that we can, uh, we can run through, and we can use that later on as we need. And then the body of the, uh, of the response there. Uh, and if I bring some traffic across onto the 902, uh, let's start up a remote desktop session. So that's my remote desktop, and we'll start to see traffic coming through on the uh, on the 902 port as well. So we, uh, first off, we receive a, a banner, and then we actually dive into into SSL um, coming down here, and then I believe somewhere around here we actually negotiate a second. We drop the first SSL tunnel, and we negotiate a second one. So that's kind of the basics of Canapé, um, how you get traffic going through there. I'm still running that in the background. Um, and how you actually start off with things. So back to the slides. Um, as I previously mentioned, and as we saw a little bit there, um, we've actually got quite a lot of um, protocol state we need to handle from within Canapé. So um, when one of these initial connections is created on this port 902, um, the, the server will actually send a, a, a banner. An SSL tunnel will be um, negotiated for authentication. Uh, that SSL tunnel will then be dropped, and a second SSL tunnel will be neg negotiated for the uh, remote desktop BNC traffic. Uh, alternatively, if we're using uh, the network file copy, we'll just have a single S uh, SSL tunnel uh, created for the authentication, and then that will be dropped, and the NFC traffic actually occurs. Uh, so the network file traffic actually occurs over plain text. So how do we go about uh, handling state transitions? This is where uh, you'll start to see I'm, I will be doing quite a few demos. Did I close that other one? No. So in this, uh, in this demo, I'm just going to show a quick um, overview of how we can actually handle this, uh, this protocol state and uh, to, to intercept the authentication traffic um, from, the, from the vSphere client. So again, so... Rearrange so we can see this a little bit better. 
So this is how we kind of start to build up these, these net graphs. Um, Canopy has a, uh, a concept of what we call meta variables. So these are variables that you can set based on um, application traffic or traffic or other events um, from within Canopy. So in this case, um, I've set up this node here down in the, in the bottom right. That'll actually set a meta variable um, when the server has, sends its banner through. So this will set the, uh, I believe I've called it state, yep, so the state variable uh, to a value authentication, sorry, auth. And we, we can then use these uh, yellow, we call them decision nodes, to actually pump traffic in different directions based on what the, um, what the value of that meta variable is. So in this case, when the, auth, uh, when the state variable is set to auth, the traffic will go down this auth directed edge. So that's all fairly simple, and you, there's some quite funky built-in filtering you can, uh, you can do to actually set up quite complex states. Uh, the second thing to note in this case is these two linked nodes in the middle here. These are a new feature of, uh, of Canopy version 1.1, which was released on Friday, and these we call layer sections. So these are what actually allow us to upgrade and downgrade the SSL encryption to, uh, to negotiate that from within the middle of a, uh, of a, of a connection. So we configure this up with uh, a currently only support SSL, uh, but we've got big plans for these in the future for, for doing some quite funky stuff. Um, so we set that up. We configure our SSL settings as before, and we point directly at a, at a subgraph of where we want that, that traffic to go, and then hopefully we shall see. Very simple uh, subgraph there. So we just want to log the traffic. Um, we don't actually know what the next state's going to be, so I want to set the state uh, meta variable as unknown and just log any, any return traffic. So hopefully, if I start up all these uh, proxies, we should actually start to see the, the SSL traffic being, being decrypted. So when I log back into my, uh, my, my VNC session here, an authentication request will be sent through Canopy. Um, perfect, and we can see that where there was SSL encrypted data before, we're actually starting to get some, some plain text data out, or some decrypted data out of it. So that using this, we can start to dissect the authentication protocol um, and go through and actually work out what's, what's happening behind the scenes there. So as you can see, it's a fairly, Simple plain text protocol. Um, and then when that's dropped, our next SSL connection um, tunnel is negotiated that we haven't met in the middle yet. So that's how we go about trying to handle these state transitions. And we can really build these up in quite complex ways. Um, there is another feature of Canopy that I'm, I'm not going to demonstrate today that we call a state graph. Uh, and that's for when you need to handle really complex state. If you're just drawing these net graphs, it can get fairly complicated, but uh, hopefully we'll be able to just stay with the net graphs during this uh, demonstration. So moving on to the authentication protocol. This is, a, as we saw there, it's a text-based protocol. It's very simple, command, space, arguments. So uh, it, it accepts some, some very simple commands, banner, user, to log in a user, pass, or xpass to provide a password or a, an, an encrypted password. It's, just obfuscated, really. Um, session to perform session auth uh, authentication, and proxy and connect to um, identify what the subsequent protocol is going to be. So whether we're going to connect to the VNC protocol, or to the network file copy protocol, or that VMDB protocol that I spoke of. Um, so it's worth noting uh, the authentication um, portion of this protocol uh, allows for username password authentication, ticket-based authentication, and session-based authentication. So ticket and session-based authentication are subtly different. Uh, one will only work for your, uh, your VNC, and the other will only work for your network file copy. But they're essentially the same thing. Next demo. So it, during this demo, I'm going to uh, show how we can create basic um, network clients from within Canopy. So use some of that previously captured data to actually remove the requirement for using the vSphere client uh, and actually pumping our own data um, 
through, through to the server without the client. I really should remember to close these as I go along. So with this, uh, this demo, I, I won't even need to bring, bring the client up to, uh, to start communicating with the server. So the differences between this project and the last project, these projects are actually designed iteratively, so each one builds on the previous, previous project. Um, the main difference here is I've created this auth client. So this isn't actually a network proxy. So this is what we call a, a, a network client within Canopy. Uh, and this will take previously captured packets. So I've, I've stored these, these packets previously. Um, and it will actually then use them as, as input. So I'm going to try and log in the user's root, uh, root with a password XXX. And then we can see in the uh, configuration of the, of the network client here, this is going to be pushed down our standard 902 net graph. Um, I've had to make slight configuration change to this net graph for, for this to, to work with a network client uh, in this, these layer selections. I've actually disabled SSL on one side of the, of the connection. So because I'm pumping um, decrypted data through it, I don't want to try and ne negotiate an SSL tunnel on my side of things, on the client side of things. But I do want the um, data to be SSL encrypted when it actually leaves Canopy. So these uh, layer sections actually allow you to do that fine-grained configuration. So hopefully, uh, all going well. When I start this, um, yep, fantastic. So I've started this client, and we're actually starting to see similar data uh, that, that we saw before. So the server's sending its banner. I'm then sending the user root commands, trying to log in as the root user. The server's telling me uh, I need to uh, provide a password for this user. I provide a password, and the server tells me the login is incorrect. And the way we de uh, determine which one of these packets um, is, is sent in a response to the server, we actually have this uh, in the network client. We have these um, filters we provide. So where uh, let's pull up a good one here. So where the server sends some data back that begins with 331 password required is the filter I've applied here. And then I will send a packet that's tagged with the pass um, command. And that, that's a tag I've manually configured. There we go, on that, on that packet there. So you can build up some fairly complex network clients using these tags and, uh, and filters. That's all very well and good, but as we saw, all this is going to do is try and log in with root, uh, root and password XXX each time. And the first time I've logged in, I already know that's not going to work. Uh, so this is where another type of node comes into play. Uh, this is going to be the first example of a, of a fuzzing node. So I've configured a fuzzing node here, um, which was in a disabled state, so I've just enabled that. Uh, this is a, a text replacement fuzzer. So Max, uh, match some text based on a regular expression and then just cycle through a number of uh, known of provider values to, to replace it. So in this case, it replaced the XXX with these passwords. So hopefully now, if, uh, again, if everything's configured correctly, we should see when I restart, this will actually go through and attempt to log in with those other passwords that I've provided. So this is actually creating a very simple password brute forcing um, tool against ESXi, and we haven't had to write a single line of code at this point. So this is very easy to, to set up, and hopefully we should see, fantastic, we have actually got a successful login there. So in a, uh, in a kind of practical sense, I've been able to get around a f three, three and a half thousand um, password guesses per minute using this um, against the ESXi, but it's worth noting ESXi does try and uh, limit the number of password attempts you can do. Um, I think we saw there, if you get an incorrect password, it'll actually hang for, uh, for a couple of seconds before actually allowing you to continue. Um, so the way we can, we can jump that up is purely by increasing the number of concurrent connections we use uh, when, when trying to do these brute forcing uh, style attacks. So that's a very, very simple um, network client there. We'll show some slightly more complex ones later on 
uh, towards the end of the talk. So the next uh, to move on to is the remote desktop protocol. So this is based on the, uh, on the VNC protocol um, with a number of VMware speci uh, specific extensions. Uh, includes all your common VNC commands, which I'm sure we all know. Uh, they're not particularly relevant, to be honest. The things I was interested in was user input. So user input packets are flagged with um, a, co a couple of bytes at the start just to say this is a user input packet, uh, a length, and then we've got two different types of user input packets, your key presses and your mouse movements. So key press, very simple, four bytes. Uh, I couldn't work out what the first byte did. It didn't seem to matter. Second byte was your scan code. Third byte was a flag, is the key pushed or is the key released? And again, couldn't work out what the fourth byte, byte did, but it didn't seem that, that important. Uh, similarly with the mouse movements, slightly more complex. Um, you've got D words. So you've got your X coordinate, your Y coordinate, two unknowns, and then your flags, which are what, uh, which buttons are pressed. So these are fairly simple packets. Um, but I'm, the reason why I'm, uh, I'm talking about these is for the next demo again, I'm going to show how we can actually parse these packets uh, within Canopy again, without, without writing a single line of code. So Canopy's got a built-in parser for, uh, for this kind of thing. So it's a, it's a, it's a GUI-based um, parsing, parsing tool where you can specify the number of bytes that you're expecting from a particular packet. Um, you can even uh, specify packet lengths that are based on, uh, on other vari variables that you've parsed out, again, all without uh, trying to write any code. So this one's currently configured with just the keyboard sequences. Um, we'll have a look at what that looks like, and then we'll attempt to, uh, to write a, a parser for the, for the mouse sequences as well and get that to work. I say attempt because it's in my uh, preparation. It hasn't worked all that well, but we'll see how it goes. Too many of these. It's worth uh, showing here as well. I've our uh, net graph for the uh, 902 protocol is starting to get a little bit more complex. We're handling a bit more state than, uh, than we were previously. So I've added, um, I've added conditions to handle the second SSL um, de decryption of the, of the VNC traffic there. Uh, that's just to show kind of how these things can, can progress. So if I open up my Remote desktop to uh, to my backtrack box. Start to see if I start putting in uh, user input. Somewhere down here. Oh, fantastic! What have I done? Again, I should probably should have practiced these. Ah, yes. So this, this was meant for a comparison to start with. So we, oops. I mean, so, so initially we're using purely unparsed traffic, which is actually quite, quite difficult to do any work with. So I believe these are input packets here. Um, sorry, these are input packets here. And just looking at that, that doesn't really tell us, tell us very much at this point. So then if I enable the, uh, the parsing nodes that I've configured, and redo that. And then restart the connection. We should then see when we provide user input packets. We actually start to get these, oops, these parsed packets we see down here. So that's much easier from an analysis perspective to actually see what's going on. Um, so you can tell which keys are pressed and whether the key state was, uh, was up or down. Um, let's quickly try and do a live demo of doing the uh, mouse, mouse input um, parsing. So we need to create a new sequence, uh, VNC mouse input. 
which was, I believe, five D words long. So we're just, again, using the, using the GUI to uh, create our five D words. And this is, uh, this speeds up things greatly from having to write your own code to do this. This is, uh, this is quite nice. Uh, rename that one to X to Y. Uh, didn't, can't remember, didn't know what those two were. And flags. Uh, we then create a parser from that sequence we just created. Uh, give it a format string. This is just so it will appear nice when we, uh, when we actually see it in the packet logs. And then we duplicate that node. So actually do some editing of the, of the net graph here and uh, make sure that's the mouse parser. So then our traffic will go through this mouse parser and hopefully come out all nice and parsed, assuming I haven't got anything seriously wrong there, which is quite a big assumption. So when we kick that off, if I make some nice pretty mouse movements, we didn't crash this time, it did when I tried it last time, so. Uh, okay, I got something wrong. But you can see, yeah, I got something wrong there. So these were my mouse movement packets that, uh, that should have been parsed, but uh, I should have perhaps taken a bit more time to try and, try and get that one right. We'll move, move away from that one. We'll move on. So that's all well and good. So we can now get our, our raw data and actually parse it into uh, something that's useful for a, for a consultant or for, for a tester to be able to see, read, and, uh, and, minute, and manipulate. And there are a large number of built-in parsers in Canapé. So I touched on initially, there was the HTTP parser. And as Canapé releases continue, we'll be adding more and more of these as we, as we come across them. Straight into the next demo. So this is going um, to show us injecting traffic into a live protocol stream. So I'm going to go back to that, um, that VNC connection. And I'm, I'm actually going to inject traffic within the SSL connection. And we can, uh, we can see quite how easy that is and, and a few fun things that can be done there. Uh, does anyone remember where I got up to? I think, I think it was five. So again, if I start my two proxies, So I've, what I've done here is I've previously captured some packets that I want to inject. Um, I'm going to load them into the, um, the injection tool of each, uh, of each proxy, and then uh, we'll hopefully see some, some injected traffic coming through. So I'm used to working on a slightly larger screen than this, so I have to try and uh, duplicate things. So we've got a, an active um, 902 connection going on. Uh, so I'll just bring up the, the injection tab of the, uh, of the proxy there. We can see we've got one active connection, so that's the connection I, I want, to, um, want to inject into. And then I choose a, uh, a node, so a graph node, of, of where I want my injected traffic to go. And in this project, I've actually created an inject node just to, to clarify things for, for myself. Um, so I can then import packets that I've previously saved. Hopefully on my desktop, yep, fantastic. So then these are the packets I'm going to inject into that, uh, that protocol stream. And hopefully when these packets are inject, uh, injected, we should see some text coming up on the, on the screen. Fantastic. I was hoping that was going to be a bit more. <laughs> yeah, anyway, anyway, we saw we, did, uh, we were able to inject some traffic there. Into, into that stream. And uh, it's worth noting, we're actually injecting right into the, into the SSL. So we're stripping it one side, injecting our traffic, 
and then re-encrypting it the other side. So we can actually get around a lot of encryption and inject directly into the uh, encry encrypted streams using this sort of technique. Clear these down. OK. So moving on slightly to the, uh, the network file copy protocol. Having to jump around quite a bit here, there's a lot we needed to cover. Um, and there's a lot of protocols um, that, that are interesting in this, in this protocol suite. So this NFC uh, protocol, I believe, is, uh, is a custom written protocol for, for VMware. Um, it's a simple file transfer protocol, so much like your FTP. Um, it's unencrypted by default, which is, uh, which is rather interesting. So that's worth noting if you are transferring super secret documents using this protocol. Probably, probably not a great idea. And it's actually got some quite complex functionality. Um, so you've got your standard file upload, download, move, copy, and delete. But I believe you can also upload files into virtual, uh, virtual disks and, and actually do some quite complex manipulation of virtual disks as well. Um, I haven't looked into it quite that much yet. It's uh, possibly a future project for me. Um, and it, it's also worth kind of or an interesting aside in that the vSphere GUI doesn't actually use very many of the, uh, the, the functions that are exposed by the protocol. So it actually only uses upload and download. Move and uh, copies and deletes are actually handled over HTTP. So why am I mentioning the, the NFC protocol? To me, this is an interesting protocol. They've rolled their own file, uh, file transfer protocol. And file transfer protocols are actually fairly difficult to get right. They involve a large amount of, of data and memory. And we all know like handling memory is, is a difficult thing to do. So it's a good place to always start fuzzing. And, uh, and that's, that's why we're here, really, isn't it? We want to find some nice, nice vulnerabilities in, in VMware. Um, so to talk about uh, Canapé's fuzzing capabilities. So the built-in fuzzers within Canapé are actually rather primitive. Um, we have your simple byte fuzzers, inter integer fuzzers, pattern fuzzers, string replacement fuzzers uh, that we saw, saw before. But these are all kind of your built-in standard everyday things. Uh, and we also allow for, for custom code uh, to, run, to write your own more complex fuzzers. And I'll touch on that a little bit later. But what it is worth noting here is that although we are using simple fuzzers, we're actually fuzzing from within the protocol stream. So we're not trying to fuzz encrypted SSL traffic uh, where the server will just throw it away because it doesn't, doesn't match any checksums. So we're actually fuzzing the data, which is then being re-encapsulated in SSL and then processed by the server. So we're actually removing that layer and, uh, and letting us actually fuzz the, uh, the protocol as it's, as it's going through. So fuzzing demos, these are always fun. So I've got two, two demos here. Um, the first one I'm going to be showing is just kind of how we configured the fuzzer in the... Um, kind of in this project. And then the next demo actually takes it a few steps further, uses a network client, and a little bit more logic behind the back end to, uh, to do automated fuzzing. And uh, I'll, I'll talk about that as we go along. So once again, if I start up my uh, fixed proxies here. Um, and all we've done here is modify the, uh, the 902 net graph to include a very simple byte fuzzer. So this is any non-encrypted traffic that gets sent out over this um, 902 uh, port I'm going to be fuzzing. Um, but in this instance, that'll only be the NFC, <laughs> NFC protocol. Uh, so I've configured this fuzzer, as I say, very simple, um, to fuzz between 0 and 4 points in a packet. Um, and it will just replace the, um, random, random points in the packet with a random byte. So very, very dumb fuzzing. Um, so log back in here. Actually, what I'm going to do first is do it without fuzzing, just so we can see a comparison. So we're trying to exercise the network file copy protocol here. So we that's uh, that's done via the configuration tab. Uh, storage. So I'll download this file called secret.txt.
So this is the, um, the unfuzzed version of the, uh, of the traffic, and then I shall turn the fuzzer on for, uh, for comparison. Request the same file again, and we'll see kind of how, how yeah, expecting an error because we've mangled the traffic and, and quite what sort of mangling is going on. So if we just do a quick comparison of these two packets. I'm not sure how well this will appear on this small screen, but we can see there are, oh, in this case, one difference. So I've injected one random byte in a random position. So this, as I say, we are, we are dealing with some, some very dumb fuzzing here, but it's surprising how much you can find just with this. Um, so this is very manual. I've got to come along here. I've got to hit download. The traffic will go through Canapé, but it's very slow. It's very... Uh, very laborious for myself. So being the lazy chap that I am, I thought, how, how can I best go about doing this? And first off, I thought, well, GUI automation, that'll do it. I'll just come along. I'll write a little script in AutoWid or whatever to, just to click the buttons that I need. Um, and I sunk many, many hours into trying to get that work, which was a little bit embarrassing for me. Um, and then I thought, well, why don't I actually do it properly and do it in Canopy? And that turned out to be a lot, lot quicker and a lot easier than... Uh, than trying to automate my, my GUI would, have, would ever have been. So if we do away with the client again, so we no longer need the client. So this is a slightly uh, advanced project. So I've implemented a number of, uh, a number of changes over where we were uh, before. So it's, it's quite a few steps of, um, steps forward, and one of the, the key things I've had to do in this case, I have had to write a small amount of code. Um, so I think we see roughly, almost that, 40, 40 lines of Python. Um, and this is purely because the NSC protocol requires session authentication. Um, so the, uh, you need the, the client to um, go to the web server, request a valid session, and then use that on the NSC side of things. And unfortunately, sessions can only be used once so you can't just grab one session, plug it in, and fuzz away with that. You actually need to go and create uh, or request a large number of sessions to be fuzzing with. Um, so that required a, a, a small change there. Uh, and I've implemented this HTTP client. So this required a small amount of logic for setting and getting cookies. Um, and the key point here is recording this uh, this session that it receives from the HTTP server. Uh, and then, as before with my uh, network client, created a number of, uh, or stored a number of packets that I'm going to use from my network clients just to drive the protocol to the point where I want to be fuzzing it. So then with my two clients, hopefully if I start this one in the background, it'll just go away and just log all of these sessions. So it'll just give me a nice cache of sessions for me to, uh, to use when I'm trying to fuzz the NFC side of things. Um, and bring in my NFC client. So it'll pick one of those sessions that's, that's already been found and use that to make the connections uh, all being well. Fantastic. So this is now just really just cycling through, cycling th through, cycling through. And I can leave this going all night. And hopefully one of the things, oops, I might be able to show you. I don't want to leave this running for too long, but um, leave it running in the background at least as we continue the talk. So I don't know if uh, anyone's aware of the, uh, oops, that was from earlier. Oh, no, that wasn't from earlier. So what we're... Um, the directory win here is where um, ESXi stores its crash dumps when it does crash. So if we keep a watch on this directory, we'll hopefully see another couple of these coming through. So somewhere down here in the depths of, of what we've just done, um, we've been able to crash the NFC or the, the host D service on our ESXi server, which is what is providing the, the NFC functionality. So fantastic, as live demos go, got a crash before I was, uh, I was monitoring it. But I'll leave that running in the background, we'll come back to that a little bit later and uh, just see, see how, 
how those are getting on. So yeah, so that was how we drove our fuzzing of the ASXi um, protocol. And we did quite a lot of this during a, a couple of week period. Um, but just using this very simple um, byte, byte fuzzing. So what did we find? So this is why we're here, and this is the project that I, uh, I was working towards. Um, we actually found a fair, fair amount. Uh, so we've got five heap uh, memory exhaustion panics. So this is where we were able to uh, convince ESXi to try, attempt to assign more memory than was in its managed heap. Um, not a huge issue from a, an exploitability perspective, but it does cause the, uh, the service to crash, which is, which is always fun for us. Um, two random unhandled exceptions. Um, this was to do with manipulating file names. File didn't exist, so it didn't know how to handle it and just, just crashed out. Um, slight, getting slightly more, uh, more interesting, so we found two null pointer de references where the, uh, we could cause this ESXi server to call the null, um, call the null page, uh, and one use after free vulnerability. So this one uh, is obviously the most interesting of the lot, and I really did hope I was going to be able to show you some uh, remote code execution from this. Um, it is possible. Unfortunately, as these things go, real, uh, real life got in the way, and I just haven't been able to find the time for that yet. Um, and a huge point at the bottom there, we are working with the uh, VMware Security Response Center to actually get these issues fixed. Um, and they've, they've confirmed these issues, and we're in very close contact just, just to make sure they've got enough information to, uh, to fix all of these. So I'm not going to be able to provide de uh, detail of the exact vulnerabilities um, from this talk. But hopefully, in the near future, that will be something you'll be able to see from us. Um, and then, as always, uh, how do we actually go about mitigating the risk of perhaps these specific issues that we've seen in ESXi? So if you're not um, restricting access to the management services to only management lands or management IP addresses, uh, that's a very good way to place to start. And that's certainly the recommended uh, implementation of these, of these services. Uh, I would recommend against using the NFC file transfer uh, function altogether, really. It's, uh, it's, it's not encrypted, and it, it does have some issues in it. Um, and that last point there, enable SSH. When you crash the, uh, the host service, it will restart itself, so you can continue to, uh, to, to get administrative access to your system, unless you crash it twice in one minute. If you crash it twice in one minute, it'll fall over, and it'll involve a, a, a trip down to your local data center to reset it manually from the console unless you've got your, uh, your SSH enabled and you can do it remotely. OK. So a little talk about where we go from here. I'm an, I am getting through these slides rather quickly, so um, we've got a bit of time. Um, projects that I've been working on in Canapé. Um, so one of them is uh, trying to implement the Sully fuzzing engine just to get a little bit more smarter fuzzing going on. Um, so for those of you who don't know, Sully is, uh, is an open source um, fuzzer written by, I believe, the guys from Tipping Point, um, written in Python, my favorite language, so really resonates with me there. Uh, and it's got quite a nice fuzzing engine, so it will perform smart fuzzing against integers and strings and, and all that other good stuff. Um, so a tool written in Python, Canapé implements Python, nice and easy. Just take, take the code, plug it in, and uh, we can actually start using that functionality. OK, admittedly, I had to make one or two small changes because we're using Iron Python rather than the C Python implementation. Um, but that actually really allowed for some much more smarter fuzzing rather than the random, uh, dumb byte fuzzing that I've been using up until, uh, up until this point. Uh, and the next one's a, uh, a kind of future project for me. So protocol informatics, uh, I believe, was... I, I can't actually remember where the talk was done um, first, but it's about using bioinformatics algorithms to um, automatically classify network, al uh, network algorithms. So, sorry, network protocols. So these algorithms uh, are originally used for slicing up DNA and proteins and things like that. Um, and it turns out they're actually a very good represent uh, representation of binary protocols. Um, so a future, future work that we'll hopefully see come, uh, coming along with Canapé will be automatic classification of uh, network protocols. Uh, that's kind of the ideal of where we want to be going. That uh, kind of brings me towards the end of, uh, end of my talk. A um, couple of people I want to thank there. Uh, James Forshaw is the author of Canapé, um, works with us in the UK. 
uh, he's implemented many requests and uh, fixed many bugs that I've been hounding him about. So uh, huge thanks to him. And uh, Mike Jordan, who also works with us in the UK, for, for pushing me to do this. So there we go. Canopy is available um, right now, so the, the newest version that uh, we released for Ruxcon is available right now on canopy.contextus.com. Uh, and if you're even, if you feel like it, you can even follow us on Twitter on uh, CTXIS.